Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Elena McCauley, and as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion and the Chair of the Planning Committee for this event, it is with great anticipation that we welcome all of you to what we expect to be a wonderful second annual Black Issue Summit. Today we anticipate... Today we anticipate listening to incredible presentations, sharing a necessary discussion as we work to build a diverse and inclusive community of students, faculty, and staff with a variety of backgrounds, perspectives, interests, and talents, and welcoming the larger Pioneer Valley community as we continue on this journey. Let us all come together with an open mind to strengthen our community today. A special thank you to our sponsors, because truly the reason why we're able to host such an amazing event for you for free is because of this, the contributions made um, by the several sponsors that we've had for the uh, program, which are listed on your program today. A uh, huge thank you to our Student Government Association, our largest contributor for the event, the Diversity Leadership Council. <laughs> the Diversity Leadership Council, Office of Student Engagement and Leadership, our Elms College History Department, the Davis Educational Foundation, as well as the Office of the President. With that being said, it is my honor to introduce to the podium the 11th President of the College of Our Lady of the Elms, Dr. Harry E. Dumay. <laughs> Dr. Dumay has served as, a se as senior in executive levels in the higher education finance and administration for 20 years at institutions including St. Anselm College, Harvard University, Boston College, and Boston University. Dr. Dumay currently serves as a commissioner, treasurer, and member of executive committees, and member of the annual report on finance and enrollment committee for the New England Commission for Higher Education. He also serves on the boards of the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in Massachusetts, the Boston Foundation Foundation's Haiti Development Institute, and as a board member for the Boston-based Youth and Family Enrichment Services and the World Affairs Council of Western Mass. <sighs> <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. DeMay to the stage as he delivers our opening remarks. Thank you for this nice obituary, Elena. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I am really thrilled to welcome all of you, students, faculty, staff of Elms College, uh, students and scholars from neighbor institutions such as Springfield Technical Community College, Holyoke Community College, Springfield College, UMass Amherst, UConn, did I miss anybody? Um, and the general public to this afternoon's summit, our second annual Black Issues Summit. I'd like to recognize some special guests who are here with us, uh, members of the Board of Trustees, Liz Dinan, Sister Jean Bosley, um, is Sister Elena here? She will probably be get, getting here later. Um, President Emerita, Sister Kathleen Keating, all of the, the other Sisters of St. Joseph who are in the audience. We are delighted that you are here with us this afternoon. Now let me also begin by thanking everyone who has helped to bring this event to life. I will first recognize our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Elena McCauley, uh, who initiated this summit last year and worked tirelessly this year to make it even more impressive. For today's event, she has brought together an esteemed panel to explore issues of equity, empowerment, community, and excellence. Please let us give Elena a big round of applause. <laughs> Elena's efforts have been guided and supported by the Dean of Student Success, Dr. Joyce Hampton, and the Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Walter Bro. We thank both of them for their support, their time, and their leadership. <laughs> of course, any good event requires a team effort. 
I'd like to thank the planning committee, which includes beside Elena, Xiomara Delbado, uh, Professor Damien Murray, Professor Scott Hardley, and Mary, Charles, Mary Claire Charles. <laughs> also, many thanks to the Student Government Association. I understand they've contributed to this event in more ways than one. So thank you to the Student Government Association. <laughs> I'd like next to extend a particular word of thanks to our four featured speakers this afternoon. Shirley Edgerton, Richard Haynes, Dr. Jana Hill, and Dr. Toussaint Lozier. I'm gonna say his name the Haitian way. <laughs> Each of today's speakers has striven to empower others and to address social, economic, educational, and political inequities. Each of them has worked and still and is still working to uplift, to guide, and to inspire. We are so pleased that they could be with us this afternoon. I'm looking forward to their speak. We just had a lovely lunch. Uh, you're in for a treat. And I thank all of you for sharing one afternoon of this Black History Month with us, exploring important topics related to African Americans, the African diaspora, Africana studies, and race relations. This year's theme is a powerful one. Equity, empowerment, community, and excellence. It is both a natural continuation of last year's theme which was solidarity in justice, as well as a natural extension of our mission here at Elms College. I indicated last year that a Black Issues Summit at Elms College is important because it fits with our mission and tradition, because it is needed today more than ever, and because of the rich academic and opportunities that it offers us. The Black Issues Summit is indeed consistent with our mission and tradition. The sisters who founded Elms College were observant of society and dedicated to respond to the needs of the day, the needs of their dear neighbors. The Elms family lives this charism through our core values of faith, community, justice, and excellence. We live those in an effort to manifest positive change in the world. These are not just the words. These are the principles that guide us in everything that we do. A Black Issues Summit is also needed today more than ever. It is hard to escape the fact that the past two years have brought to the surface many unresolved issues in race relations in the United States. The option of ignoring the problem because talking about it makes us uncomfortable is really no longer a viable path. The alternative of pointing fingers, rallying in our physical or social media corners is also not constructive because we see what, is, what it has done to our society. Our role as an academic institution offers a more constructive path. We can do what Elms College does best, lift one another up by educating one another and expanding each other's horizon. Finally, a Black Issues Summit is important because of the rich academic landscape it invites us to explore. Let me spend a little bit more time on this topic. The evolving but increasingly ubiquitous fields of black studies, African American studies, and African diaspora studies are truly critical nowadays for a well-rounded education. How important is that contribution? Well, consider this. The November 16, 2018 issue of the Chronicle Review sought to determine the new canon, the new body of literature with which educated individuals should be familiar. 
the editors asked leading scholars to list the 20 most influential books in the past 20 years. The manuscripts listed included well-known publications such as Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, as well as obscure ones like a small monograph called The History Manifesto. Probably Professor Damien Murren and Dr. Lozier are the only ones that might know about this book in the audience. <laughs> but more to the point of our conversation this afternoon, five of the 20 publications related to the field of black studies. In The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, Michelle Alexander explains how the war on drugs, quote, disproportionately targets black communities. Dorothy Roberts' book, <coughs> Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, tackles the, quote, American tensions between freedom and liberty, individual choice, and collective governance. The third book, Critical Race Theory, the key writings that formed the movement, edited by Kimberly Crenshaw, influenced many of us in our thinking and our understanding on how race distributes wealth and power. Shapeshifters, Black Girls, and the Choreography of Citizenship is a book by Amy Meredith Cox that challenges, quote, academic and popular assumptions about what civic engagement and democratic participation look like in the 21st century. Finally, in Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision, a book that has been called a guide for activists, Barbara Rensby, quote, charts the history of the 20th, 20th century civil rights movement, end quote, through Baker's detailed biography. So through books and articles in peer-reviewed journals, scholars continue to add to the new canon and to the growing literature. In the past year, the Journal of Black Studies has published some highly insightful and intellectually provocative articles, a few of which touch upon issues that directly affect those of us who work and study in higher education. In the most recent issue, researchers investigated racial inequality in post-secondary education settings. In the November 2018 issue, Preston and Palmer examined the unique role that historically black colleges and universities can play in their students' academic careers. In September 2018, the journal published a special issue in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the first doctoral program in black studies, which is housed at Temple University in Pennsylvania. The contribution of these scholars, like those of all scholars, helps us to understand ourselves, our dear neighbors, and the world around us. It contributes to advance our knowledge, and this is our quest this afternoon. The beauty of working at an institution of higher learning, in addition, an institution of higher learning which aspires to unite neighbors with neighbors without distinction, is that we can have afternoons like this one, in which we pursue understanding and knowledge, in which we speak to, we seek to apprehend, honor, and respect our respective experiences. Because before we can truly come together in any meaningful way, we must take the time to be mindful of each other's perspectives and each other's background and reality. So once again, I'm thrilled to welcome all of you this afternoon and to thank our speakers for contributing to our journey toward greater knowledge and understanding. Thank you all for making this second session of the Black Issues Summit at Elms College so successful and meaning meaningful. I encourage you all to listen deeply, to ask thoughtful questions, and to carry what you learn here today out into the world and use it to work for positive change. Thank you.
technical difficulty. Thank you, Dr. Dumay, for your opening remarks. I would now like to introduce junior graphic design student and secretary of the Diversity Leadership Council, Usman Safir, to the stage as he introduces our first speaker. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am honored to introduce our first speaker, Richard Haynes. Richard Haynes currently serves as the Associate Director of Admissions for Diversity at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, Richard joined UNH's admissions team as Associate Director for Diversity Recruiting in 2005. His service has been fueled by his deep belief that all students, regardless of background, race, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religion, uh, gender, or gender identity should have access to higher education. He has served for many years as a member of the Retention Committee and he is active in multiple organizations that support students of color, including the Black Student Union and the Latino Latina group Mosaico. Every year he presents Discover UNH, a series of programs on campus uh, that make it possible for students of color and low income first generation white students to envision themselves in college. He recently received a Presidential Award of Excellence in 2018 at UNH for his service in excellence. In addition to his commitment to equity and inclusion, Richard is an amazing artist, painter, photographer, educator, lecturer, professor, mentor, and a strong advocate for social justice. He received his MFA from the Pratt Institute, Institute in, the Bro in Brooklyn, New York, as served as an adjunct prof professor at McIntosh College. An artist in residence for Historic New England and a faculty mentor at UNH for their McNair Graduate Opportunity Program. As a visual storyteller, he held positions at the Courier Museum, Eastside House Settlement, South Bronx Community Action Theater, and PS6 Model Cities Program in New York. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Richard Haynes. Hold on, hold on for just a second before you start the clip. Good evening, late or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see you all here today. And I can't wait to literally tell you my story. I would normally say to people that if you thought that I was born with this bow tie and suit on, no, I've earned this outfit. <laughs> and so. And so you're going to get the opportunity, I'm going to ask Elena to play me a clip. I found this clip many years ago. I come from the Deep South. And this clip really tells you a lot about my story and where I come from. So as you look at this clip, and I need you to listen very carefully to this clip. And as you look at this clip, I imagine a five-year-old kid in this, through this whole process. Imagine me. I think it's so important for us to learn how to tell our stories. I've listened to a lot of wonderful stories today, this morning, from students. I need you to tell your own story. I want you to understand that the story that I'm about to tell is my story. It's no one else's story. It is my story. It's my family's story. And it's amazing how it has helped me to be a much better person than I am that I was in the past, but that I am today. It's so important to tell your own story because you can be anything you want to be. Here we go. Over here, something said. All day, John. Over here, something said today. We're paying today. We're paying more in the white town. Seven cents, seven years today. Seven and six today. Here's seven and six. 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 Eight shot a box in Uganda to you if you pull today and we pull what we got to pull today, you have $11 in your pocket. This is not taking place in the Congo. 
It has nothing to do with Johannesburg or Cape Town. It is not Nyasaland or Nigeria. This is Florida. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. This is a shape up for migrant workers. The hawkers are chanting the going peace rate at the various fields. This is the way the humans who harvest the food for the best fed people in the world get hired. One farmer looked at this and said, we used to own our slaves, now we just rent them. The Secretary of Labor looked at the migrant plight and said, I think they're the great mass of what I've called uh, the excluded Americans. They are people who cry out, the workers and their children and their wives, who cry out for some assistance and uh, whose uh, plight is a shame. It's a shame in America. The president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest farmers organization, says, I think that uh, most uh, social workers would agree that it's better for a man to be employed even if his capacity is such as uh, to limit his uh, income. And uh, we take the position that it's far better to have thousands of these folks who are practically unemployable, earning some money, doing some productive work for at least a few days in the year. This is an American story that begins in Florida and ends in New Jersey and New York State with the harvest. It is a 1960 Grapes of Wrath that begins at the Mexican border in California and ends in Oregon and Washington. It is the story of men and women and children who work 136 days of the year and average $900 a year. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. Well, I don't know. It don't look like we'll ever get ahead. I guess we'll just have to keep going till we can find something better. A minister named Cassidy, who works with them, says, they are just as bad as the slaves. Only on name they are not the slaves, but in the way they are treated, they are worse than the slaves. And somebody has to make a thousand dollars out of his sweat. Is that a slave or not? They are the migrants, workers in the sweatshops of the soil, the harvest of shame. That video goes on much longer. It is a, much, a must watch, please. I was born to two extraordinary parents, but unfortunately, neither one of them had education at this time. It's what we call today a first generation family. I'm sitting in my house one day in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I put a recorder in front of my dad because I needed to know his story. I realized my father is getting of age, and He's going to pass, and I don't have that story. And I sat that recorder in front of my dad, and I said, Dad, tell me your story, Dad. The one thing I remember about that story, more so than anything else in that field, he's a sixth grader, and he's in that field with his father, and he literally watched his father turn and started pulling at his shirt and lie dead in that field at the age of 45 and died of a massive heart attack as that sixth grader watched his father take his last breath. He quit school in the sixth grade to, his, to help his mother support the four younger siblings. And like my father, my mother's on the same boat. Her father's in that field as well. But he was an entrepreneur because $900 a year was not going to feed his family. He grew crops on the side, and every weekend he would go down to the marketplace and sell his wares. One day, Grandpa only knew he was not feeling well, but he was determined that $900 a year was not going to feed his family. He went down to that marketplace, and tradition would tell you that Grandpa only would come back and knock on the door 
and my mother, an eighth grader, would run to the door because her father had made enough extra money to buy her a Tootsie Roll lollipop. But this day, Grandpa Ollie was not at the door. The gentleman who drove him down to the marketplace looked that little girl in the eyes and said, your father's just passed away. He died of pneumonia. She quit school in the eighth grade to help her mother support the three younger siblings. Years have gone by and they've gone to the same Presbyterian church and hormones kicked in. They got married and they had little Richard. And when they had little Richard, by the age of five, little Richard was expected to be in that field alongside them. Every cucumber you could twist off of a vine and every tomato you could put in a basket and they charge all the way down to the other end of that line and put it on a scale and the farmer dropped change in their hands. And at that time, they're dusting the fields, pesticide. They're the first in the field with the, with the uh, dusting of pesticide. There are snakes in that field. There are bees in that field and that hot sun is in that field. Little Richard learns how to read by the age of seven. And when he learned how to read, these were humiliating white signs pasted all over my community downtown. Signs that told me that I was a nobody. No Negroes allowed in public parks. No Negroes allowed in public beaches. No Negroes allowed in hotels, motels. No Negroes allowed in restaurants or public libraries. I had my own bathroom, clearly told me that I was a nobody. I had my own water fountain. And I asked mom, I said, why? Why are they picking on us? She looked me in the eyes and she said, son, you are just as good as anyone else. If there is anyone in this room under the sound of my voice, you're feeling out of place in this school, in this community, in this country, I'm here to tell you as my parents have told me, you are just as good as anyone else. Let no one's opinion of you, son, to become your reality. You were born to win. But in order to win, you've got to get a plan to win, son. And you must prepare to win, son. And don't you ever, ever expect not to win, my son. And every time you get knocked down on your back, if you could look up, I need you to get up. That's for all of us. Every human being on the face of this earth. So my parents decide, you know, we can't live like this anymore. African American in the early 1900 by 1940, mass population moving out of the deep south, getting on that train system and the nights and getting on the train system so that others don't know that you're leaving because you want to go to the big city. Big city is going to provide you better ways. California, and you want to go to New York and you want to go to Boston. We've got to escape this thing. My parents decided we're going to go to New York. Mom went ahead, sent us these beautiful note cards. And as Stevie Wonder would say it, New York, just as I pictured it, skyscrapers and everything. Got in that green 1954 Ford. Once mom had found that apartment for us, got in that green 1954 Ford, and we went up 90, 95 north. And nighttime, we finally got out of the Lincoln Tunnel. We saw New York City reflecting on the water just like that postcard. But that car entered Midtown Manhattan, and I'm a little boy at nine years old, holding on at the windows, looking at all of these skyscrapers, waiting for this car to stop. But that car kept rolling, and that car kept rolling. And Midtown Manhattan went over the horizon line. And where did we wind up? Harlem, 127th Street. Streets were narrow, not quite as bright as Midtown Manhattan. 
stepped out of that vehicle, the drug of choice that's affecting us in our country right now is the same drug of choice affecting us in 1958. Men and women standing and sleeping at the same time. I'm going, Mom, nine years old, Mom, what is this? I thought you were going to bring us someplace better. Better, son? Better only if you make it better. Because for them it was better. They're no longer in this dusty hot field. They're now cleaning hotel rooms. Better for them. Better, Mom? Switch off the light in this apartment. Give it about 30 minutes. Switch it back on. And I have never seen so many cockroaches, never even heard about the word cockroaches. Cockroach all over everything. My little 13-year-old sister one night screamed to the top of her lung. A cockroach had embedded itself in her ear. Mom told me this was better. Give it a little time. Let the building quiet down. The spirits and the soul of the people are at perfect rest. My brother and I slept in the same room in the same bed. Give it a little while. And all of a sudden, the walls and the ceiling come alive. Rats running through the walls. Rats running through the across the ceiling. And all of a sudden, they run across your bedroom floor. And my brother and I would look at each other and say, I'm not getting out of this bed for anybody. These rats were the size of squirrels. I am not getting out of this bed. I'm going to hold this until tomorrow. My brother and I decide we're going to wage war on these four squirrel-sized rats. We're going to go to Central Park, and we're going to use our southern skills, and we are going to destroy these four-sized squirrel rats that come into this apartment every night. Heating pipes that go from floor to floor. If you didn't have that metal disc on it, the rat comes from the floorboard and right up into the apartment. But this night, we are going to destroy those four squirrel-sized rats. Railroad flat, living room on one side, master bedroom on the other. Rooms all the way down the hall. Mom always kept the light on in the bathroom. The reason why, because that's where the rats always came out of. One night, we're sitting in the, live in the kitchen as a sudden shutdown. Hot chocolate and tea, and the cornbread had just come out of the oven, and the oven was left on because it was a chilly night. My little brother saw this big rat coming from underneath the refrigerator. He went to swat that rat, hit it, and that rat ran up that little boy's broom, across up his shoulder, just jumped right onto the kitchen sink. A couple days later, we did smell him. He did nail him. This night, we are going to wage rattle. We're going to wage war on these rats. My brother and I are sitting waiting for the building to quiet down. The light is on. The first rat ran out of that bathroom. Little Floyd jumped on the couch, pulled back on his bone, released the arrow. That rat jumped over that arrow and back into the bathroom. It's like it was though they were playing a game with us now because they're coming in and out of the bathroom and we're pulling back on the bowls and releasing the arrows and pulling back on the bowl and releasing the arrows and we didn't injure one of those rats. We are going to retreat to rethink our military strategy over a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> now you could possibly see I'm the neat guy of this story. I went to the kitchen sink because I was not going to go in that bathroom. I went to the kitchen sink, switched out my mouth, rinsed my hand off, and crawled to bed. Little Floyd, six years old, don't know what he was thinking. He came to bed and didn't wash his face and hands and fingertips off. The next morning, we woke up. To this day, I don't know whether one rat was in bed with us or all four of those rats were in bed with us. But every place that little boy left peanut butter and jelly, the rats chewed on him. Next morning, we woke up. There's blood all over that bed. I woke up and I said that the only reason why we're in this predicament was because of the lack of education. It is education, students, that will give you freedom and opportunity in this country like nothing else besides a divine being. So if anyone in this room is thinking that I don't need this, you need this more so than ever. It is education that will give you freedom and opportunity. Several years of, let me back up, just in case you think all Harlem was like that. Ah, you don't know your Harlem history. On the west side of Harlem, you had James Baldwin. 
Madam C.J. Walker, first female African-American, first woman uh, millionaire in the country. You had Langston Hughes, James Baldwin. You had um, Percy Sutton, Adam Clayton Powell. These are all great politicians and preachers. You had Duke Ellington, all living on the west side of Harlem, and we had just come out of the Harlem Renaissance, so we had just showcased our brilliance. But unfortunately, because of the lack of education, you were doomed to live in a squalor. Several years have gone by, and I tip my hat off to the leaders in this room, and I tip my hat off to the administrators and college professors who are mentoring young students here today and will hopefully go on and mentor young students. Mrs. Mary M. H. Powell's in the middle of that civil rights movement, little petite Jewish woman out of Mount Vernon, New York, saw something me I could not see in myself. She says, Richard, one day, you're gonna be an extraordinary artist. That woman took me out of New York every, every Friday. Me and my mother jealous. Every Saturday morning we'll be at the Cooper Hewitt, the Whitney, the Modern Art, the Guggenheim, and every museum in Midtown Manhattan sit me down and taught me about lines and shapes and forms and color and about the Greeks in the proper portion. Students, be mindful. When you are out of touch or away from your mentors and they ask how you're doing, you must tell them the truth. That woman made sure this was a middle school teacher, made sure I got placed in high school, the best high school for art in New York City, High School of Art and Design. She was uptown, I was downtown. She will call me and say, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Mrs. Powers. I was more concerned about basketball, my bell-bottom pants and how it was bleached out on the bottom, my afro and dashiki and those girls in miniskirts. Four years happened that quick. And I was not prepared to go on to the war, the Vietnam War. Well, we know what happened to people who were not prepared academically to go on to college, that you fought the war. I did the four years in the military, returned home. Mrs. Mary Mage Powers met me at JFK Airport and says, let's finish your education now. When you mess up students, you gotta go backwards in order to go forwards. I did one year in community college, and she said, let's get right into that BFA. Let's get right into that MFA. I got my BFA, got right into my MFA, and unfortunately, Mrs. Mary Mace Powers died before I completed my MFA. But I tell you, I stand here before you today a nationally known American artist. My work will go anywhere from five to $10,000 a penny. Education gave me freedom and opportunities. I didn't allow anybody's opinion of me to become my reality. I realized that I was born to win. And I needed to stay focused in order to win. Well, you can easily be seduced. And we must be careful, especially as people of color, that you are not easily seduced. And in that seduction, Bell Hook would say, when you finally get what you need, she would say to us, I got mine, you go and get yours. Well, I had mine in my back pocket. I became a very success successful photographer in New York City. And in that success, my God was in my back pocket, that bank account. Moved to New Hampshire, I could live any place in the country now. Moved to New Hampshire, and all of a sudden, I did not make a dime for three years. Thank God I had a bank account that was safe. Could not make a dime. I'm a $225,000 a year photographer in New York City and can't make a dime here? A moral decline, a spiritual decline. I got to a point that I wanted to take my life. I did not want to live anymore. I went back to being a nobody. My wife would say to me, if who you are is what you have, and if what you have is lost, then who are you? It was my opportunity to discover who I was. But I was fortunate. Sunday morning, I was going to commit suicide. Saturday, I went to a wedding. 
having the last dance with my wife, someone nudged me on my shoulder and says, I've got a message for you from God. I said, yeah, right. But thank God I did go to that church the next morning because I was going to get in one of my big, fine cars, sail down 95, take off the seatbelt and slam into an overpass. Life was going to take care of my kids, the insurance company. Not really. Went to that church, and everything I needed to hear has revitalized me for the last 29 years. You've got to learn to discover who you are. You must learn to discover who you are. Are. There are no mistakes in this room. Not one mistake in this room. Struggle brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about endurance. And endurance brings about character building. And you shall lack nothing. Sitting in the classroom. I'm going to speed up because I know I have five more minutes. Sitting in the classroom. This is the thing that I've learned in this new character that I have. Sitting in a classroom as a professor teaching art. Moved into this young girl's space, young white girl. And all of a sudden she goes, she pulled back. I go, oh, Richard, you're a guy. You're too close in her space. Next week she comes with KKKKK tattooed on her fingers. Following week, she comes with KKKK tattooed on her fingers. Give it a month later, she had two SWAT stickers, two inch SWAT stickers put on each side of her wrist. Four weeks later, she comes with an Aryan Nation cross wrapped around her neck and tattooed around her neck. She failed the class not because I was against her, she just didn't do any work. But the dean says, Do you want her back in your class? Yes, put her back in my class. She comes back to my class and she performs exactly the same way. One night, this young lady is sitting in this class. Both of us are left alone. Everything that happens to us in life happens for a purpose. There are no mistakes. Are you willing to fit it into the divine spirit's place, everything that happens to us. I said to Andrea, I said, Andrea, would you mind if I bought you a book tomorrow? She comes back. I went to Barnes & Noble that night, and I bought her an $85 softest leather Bible you can find. I said, only two books, Second John, Third John, books of love. That woman read the book. And that woman came back there afterwards and literally changed her life. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living this life every day, every day on the face of this earth simply because we are going to become extraordinary human beings so that we could be extraordinary human beings for other every time your footsteps cross across another person, it should be for the purpose of making that person's life better. Everything you do in life should be for making someone else's life better than it was the day before you. I think that's what the, the biblical quote was. What kind of fruits do you bear in your life? I'd like to end this conversation with the kind of fruits that happened in my life. I have another colleague of mine who are going to read a letter from this young girl. I left the University of New Hampshire, went off to UNH. This young lady graduated. And once she graduated, she wrote me this letter. Listen to this letter. Listen to the fruits in which you bear. Hi, Richard. I wanted to take a minute and write to you, not only to say hello, but to say thank you as well. January 6th passed, and it was a very special day for me, more or less a huge day of reflection. I looked back on this past year, and specifically last January 6th, 
when I chose to admit to my powerlessness over addiction to you. I wanted to let you know that day was the most powerful day of my life, which resulted in changing my life of living a day at a time, now for 378 days. My higher power was most definitely speaking through you that day. And for the very first time in my life, I listened. I took your knowledge and I put it to good use. I'm so grateful that you helped me and that there was a much better way of living life than I chose to live at that time. I'm so thankful I had the willingness to seek your guidance and the open-mindedness to consider the message you carried. It means so much to me that you, all, that you truly believed in me, supported me, and encouraged me, even though you hardly knew me at all. I also wanted to take this opportunity to say I'm so sorry, because I was not only the, I was not the nicest person. As I saw one who, as I was one who saw colors for colors and not people for people. I can honestly say the night I reached out for help, I learned two valuable lessons. One being that there is a loving God out there willing to forgive me and love me. I was looking in all the wrong places for him as he speaks through people instead. Secondly, a shade of skin does not define anyone as a person and that I had a lot of learning to do. I was amazed that despite my ignorance and my attitude and tattoos, etc., that bluntly stated my opinions, you still chose to help me that night when I needed it the most and that was the biggest lesson of all of them. So here I am, sober, over a year sober, and so much has changed for me. I'm successful and proud, my esteem is back, and I'm truly accomplishing my goals and dreams. I'm recognizing God's miracles as I am now carrying one of his gifts inside me now. I will soon be a mother. Most of all, though, I have found the happiness you told, you told me I would find. I thought it would be a long shot to reach. The real miracle is, though, that I'm feeling and experiencing all of these things sober, and that is the greatest gift in the world. Thank you, Richard, for quite literally saving my life and helping me see there was more to life than putting a needle to my arm because you were so right. Thank you so much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad that I went through all the struggles that I went through. I'm so glad that I endured the pain because I built character. We can resolve the issues we have in the world. It's not in America, only it's in the world. But you have to be able to move out of the way, die to self. Sorry I'm taking you all to church this afternoon. But we've got to let the Spirit of God live, move, and have his being on the inside of us. Now listen to this last closing thing. Dying to self. Unknown. When you are forgotten or neglected, and you don't hurt with insult, but your heart is happy, that is dying to self. When your advice is disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart, and take it all in patient, loving silence, that is dying to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear disorder, irreg irregularity, tardiness and annoyance, and endure it as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. When you never care to refer to yourself in conversation or record your own good works, or itch for praise after an accomplishment when you can truly love to be unknown, that is dying to self. When you can see your brother or sister prosper and can honestly rejoice with him and feel no envy, even though your needs are greater, that is dying to self. When you're content with any food, any offering, any arraignment, any climate, or any society, that is dying to self. And when you can take correction and you can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly with no rebellion or resentment rising within your heart, that is dying to self. I thank you all for your time, and I wish you all the best. floor to questions from the audience. Any questions? By the way, my mother graduated from college before I did. 
Yeah. She didn't say go to college, so let me show you how to go to college. She became a social worker. My baby brother runs two banks in, um, in Staten Island. My brother, who got bit by a rat, he runs a very successful advertising agency in New York City. I am an artist. Yeah. All right, so the next speaker is on. Thank you. Let's give it up one more time for Richard and his story. All right. Next, I would like to introduce Marie Claire Charles, student member of the Planning Committee for the Black Issue Summit and MBA student at Elms College. I'm honored to bring this spectacular student to the stage at this time. Our next speaker comes to us from William Patterson University, where she serves as a tenured professor in the Department of Secondary and Middle School Education and chairperson of the Department of Africana World Studies. Dr. Jana Hill began her own love of education during her time at Howard University, where she got a degree in microbiology. She later earned her Master of Arts in teaching from none other than Elms College in 1993, specializing in secondary education in biology. She holds a doctorate in urban and multicultural education from Columbia University and specializes in teacher preparation for urban context, womanist and black feminist theoretical frameworks and multicultural science education. Dr. Dr. Hill states that, quote, my focus has been to prepare teachers to serve students with diverse cultural and experiential backgrounds. Her work in multicultural teaching, STEM education, portraiture methodology has garnered several major grants from the United States Department of Education, the Taub Foundation, the New Jersey Department of Education, as well as awards, including a certificate of excellence in teacher education from the New Jersey Department of Education. Dr. Hill is also a widely published author and editor, including a recent book titled Star Teachers of Children in Poverty. Dr. Hill, I think we're all excited to have you back at Elms. Please well, help me welcome Dr. Hill to the floor. Well, hello, Elms. I'm going to put this on in a minute, but I have to just get situated here for a second. Let me see who's in the audience. Who is in the audience? Where are my students? Students, raise your hands. Oh, there's got to be more students than that. Students, raise your hands. Hi. All right. So the, the last presenter brought you to church. I'm going to bring you back to school. <laughs> Just find a... Sorry, I want my clicker to work. Okay. Well, first of all, I am honored. Excuse me for a second. You know, all these technical difficulties. There we go. <laughs> all right. I am honored 
and humbled to be here this afternoon and to return to Elms College for an event such as this. Thank you for inviting me to participate in your second annual Black Summit. I especially thank President Dumay for his insight and vision in the possibility of Elms in this region and community. The Black Summit Committee for their warm welcome and thoughtful organization of the day. We really do need to create more spaces like this so that discourse can occur. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Everybody shake your heads. Yes. yes. I am able to be here because I stand on the shoulders of giants. One particular who is in the room today, my mother, Sandra Warren. Yes. You should know that while my mother is responsible for planting and nurturing my educational seeds, much of my perspective in life's work blossomed through the guidance and mentorship of Dr. Ann Harrison who just recently retired. We had frequent meetings in her office on the top floor of Marion Hall. So I know that she is with us in spirit as she speeds through New Zealand. So in preparing for this talk today, I wondered, what could I say about equity, justice, and education that would spark the audience in ways that they may need? Should I show my anger <laughs> about education? <laughs> uh, those savage inequalities, injustices in education, particularly in our urban schools? So I thought about my story, my own becoming. Did you catch that nod to the first lady? <laughs> So I'm going to talk today about coming full circle because we don't always get a chance to do that, right? We are blessed to be able to come full circle. 1993, I was here. Let's not count that number of years. <laughs> but I do want to talk today about what the president had, had talked to us about earlier in his introductions, right? Community, social justice, equity in education, science teaching, of course, cultural relevance, and star teachers. My students in the audience, did you get that? You're going to take some notes out. If you can. How do I do this? There we go. There we go. Now I think I can move around. So. I grew up in Massachusetts, but I was born in New York, and I tend to take the A train, which is an express. So if I go too fast, you just say, Dr. Hill, slow down. I need to get a picture of that slide. So I want to talk about my journey. I was a microbiology major at Howard University, and in my senior year, summer of my final year, I did a research project on uh, the lack of scientists in the high school biology classroom. I'm sorry, the lack of scientists in, uh, in, in, in industry. And the research project taught me that the reason why there was this lack, this underrepresentation of scientists, is because they didn't have, students didn't have role models. So I decided to become a role model. I decided to become a science teacher so students could see in me an aunt or a cousin doing science. You have to excuse me. When I teach, I move, I touch, so forgive me. Um, but the last presenter talked about possibility, right? And so that is actually what I wanted to do as well. I wanted students to see the possibility of themselves through me. So. I needed certification to do that. Any education students in the, in the room? Yeah, you can raise the high. You can be the only two. All right. And so 
needed certification to do that, and that's where Elms welcomed me. Dr. Harrison, though, mentored me in doing a, a research project. I wrote a thesis while I was here on the infusion of African-American scientists in the high school biology curriculum. So I was trying to merge this love for science as well as my new sort of love for urban ed and Africana studies. So I taught biology, and I then conducted professional development of teachers on cultural relevance in science. And I started talking to them about uh, African American scientists, women scientists, and they looked at me like, who are these people? <laughs> so my students in the room, you wanna take a picture of this? So you can make sure that you, if you don't know them now, Dr. Shirley Jackson, Dr. Everett Just, Alexa Kennedy, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, Dr. Charles Drew, Mae Jemison, I know you know Mae Jemison, Ellen Ochoa, et cetera, right? Benjamin Banneker, Louis Latimer. And they didn't know them, so I said, I said to myself, how can students become scientists if they aren't taught scientists, if the teachers don't know about these scientists, right? So I said, oh my gosh, I have to teach a larger audience, and to do that, you need a doctorate. So I went um, to TC um, to teach this larger audience to, to get a doctorate in urban and multicultural education. So that's my journey. When I was at Elms, I looked at cultural relevance and education. And I started with this man. I know you know who he is. Who is he? Nobody in the two front rows can say. <laughs> who is he? Well, thank you. It's the reason why we are here this, this today and this, in celebrating this month. He is the father of black history. Carter G. Woodson wrote in 1933, The Miseducation of the Negro. And he said in that text, that the thought of the inferiority of the Negro is drilled into him in almost every class he enters and in almost every book he reads. How long ago was that, 1933? Math people in the room, do the math. Okay. 86 years ago, right? Hold on to that. I don't see any students taking notes. Okay. When looking at cultural relevance at Elms, I also looked at Drs. Powell Hobson, who also uh, solidified what um, Woodson was saying in his text. Textbooks contain few representations of black Americans and their contributions to history. I looked at Asante, professor at Temple University, who said that schools reinforce feelings of limited self-worth. I looked at Janetta Cole's work who talked about people without a knowledge of who they are cannot successfully participate in determining the direction in which they wish to go. We also know that as Sankofa, yeah? And then finally, Atwater, Mary Atwater, who said in terms of science that black males are ignored in science classrooms until they misbehave and too few black females are praised for their science learning. I'm gonna leave this here because I saw somebody taking a picture. Go ahead, take it. Okay, I'm gonna move. So while I was at TC, I was able to, to delve a little bit deeper into a theory of cultural relevance, of black feminist epistemology, and again, to further acknowledge Mr. Haynes' uh, talk, whose story gets told. And I delve deeper into this quote here, whose knowledge, why that knowledge, and for whose benefit? What are we learning? Why are we learning it? And who is benefiting from that learning? Do you understand what I mean by that? Everybody shake your head, yes. 
I researched something called emancipatory pedagogy. I was excited about this term when I learned it. Emancipatory pedagogy. What do you think that is? Emancipatory pedagogy. Yes! Who, who? I think I have another professor in the house. Yes, teaching for freedom, right? And so Anna Julia Cooper, who was a teacher, who wrote A Voice from the South, in, 19, in, sorry, in 1892 said, not the boys less, but the girls more. Paulo Freire talked about <coughs> consensualization in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Bell Hooks, Teaching to Transgress. Gloria Ladson Billings, The Dream Keepers, Successful Teachers of African American Children. Successful Teachers of African American Children. Doesn't mean that they are also African American, it just means that they are successful teachers of African American children. And not that she uh, coined this phrase, but she made this phrase much more popular, culturally relevant teaching. You guys still with me? So what kind of equity and justice do we see in education? In what ways do we center our children? Where and how do they see themselves? Do black and brown children see the possibility of who and what they can become? One more? Do they see it in the curriculum? We may see it during Black History Month. We may see it during Women's History Month. But do they see it in October or November? And so I, I'm constantly wondering about that. And I wonder if Woodson's words that he wrote so long ago are still true. Those are my tribe readers. <laughs> the one right there, that's, that's my son, mommy's grandson. <laughs> but you know, I, I could have chosen to show you a different picture, one that was uh, where he is on the field but I chose this one because it's important for him to see the possibility of himself around books. <laughs> and it's important for you to also see black boys around books, right? So at my current institution, I've had the opportunity to direct major grants and two projects I think with most meaning have been a Patterson Teachers for Tomorrow grant project, which is a Grow Your Own uh, teacher preparation scholarship program, and then the NOICE project, the National Science Foundation. Um, we have a phase one and a phase two for my administrators in the audience. Um, it's a scholarship, fu scholarship funding for STEM and education majors who promise to teach in high needs or urban schools. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these two grants. Um, PT4T project goals. We wanted to increase the number of uh, Patters teachers in Patterson. And so if you don't know the area, um, the, my, the institution where I am currently um, at, it's, it's William Patterson University. It's in Wayne, New Jersey, but it's, it began in Patterson, New Jersey, which is adjacent to Wayne, right? Um, just like Harlem is adjacent to Morningside Heights, you follow me? Um, and so it, it's, uh, it's considered one of the, the, the three, one of the three largest urban areas in New Jersey. So we wanted to increase the number of, uh, of students from Patterson successfully graduating from college, completing a teacher certification program, and then going back to Patterson to teach. So like I said, it was a grow your own. It was a homegrown sort of program. We wanted to increase the number of teachers of color who know the Patterson community and are committed to teaching and, and excellence in Patterson. And we wanted to increase the number of students getting accepted to college 
and graduating from college. And so, again, my administrators in the room know a little bit about that because we're always concerned about retention, right? And so our outcomes, 50 students entered the university in, in a span of 10 years, 25 students graduated, 18 with certification. There are seven teaching in Patterson, five teaching in high needs districts in New Jersey, and another two teaching in suburban districts in New Jersey. Five received advanced degrees, three currently teaching, I'm sorry, three currently in graduate programs. A few of them have gone back to the high school in which they teach, right? Uh, and that actually is the infamous East Side High School with the, uh, with the, the principal, with the, yeah, yeah, that, that one. And then of course three were able to go global and travel to India. So for me, this is good stuff, right? We had a couple of research questions. We wanted to know how their experiences as students informed their commitment to teach and in what ways they attempted to change the school system. And so community teachers by uh, Peter Murrell, he talks about those teachers who are invested in the uplift of the community. A colleague and I talk about teacher insiders, understandings of a student, of a, un your understandings as a student and as a teacher, you are inside that space. And so what we were really saying is that students in a Grow Your Own program are invested in the uplift of that community, right? Having been empowered themselves, these community teachers will then empower others. And so here's what the themes told me in the research. They're able to relate, they act as role models, they have high expectations, and they perceive students and schools differently than most. I'll stop here because I see another picture taker. <laughs> In the noise program, I was interested in getting STEM majors through teacher certification. So again, that love for science, right? So we were able to attract 50 STEM majors to receive teacher certification. 24 have met their obligation to teach in a high needs school. 26, another 26 are on track to fulfill those, that obligation. And by the way, that obligation is a two year commitment. Um, about one third were teachers of color. And our goal was really to increase science and math teachers in high needs districts in, in, in urban schools. But we wanted to know the impact. So preliminary data suggests that, well, participants are inspired in the noise program to teach in a high needs district. They feel like they're giving back. Participants found that Funding eased the financial stress of becoming a teacher. They were successful in the classroom because they note their high evaluation scores. They use inquiry-based teaching techniques, fun activities. But when I asked them about social justice, when I asked them how they see themselves as change agents, so, so I'm trying to bridge, right? You follow me? I'm trying to bridge this, this, this sort of theoretical framework or ideas of what Woodson was talking about with science and, and having students out in the field. And so when I asked them about social justice, what do you think they said? What do you think they said? I can't hear you, sorry. 
Um, mostly. Yeah, so there's not a problem with the brain. There's, it's, what's the problem? Yes, what's the problem? That's a good one. Anybody else? We treat all of our kids equally. Yes, yes. We don't see color. <laughs> so most responded with answers such as, oh, we talk about current events. Or social justice is not really in the curriculum. You know, we've changed over to the, uh, the next-gen science standards, so it's not really in there. Or I'm growing into being a social justice educator. Or here's a good one. We acknowledge holidays. <laughs> so remember what I said about Black History Month and Women's History Month, right? OK. So you can. You, kind of get a picture of how I'm feeling as I'm, as I'm getting this, this data, right? One teacher that we interviewed said, I'm not just someone in the classroom. <coughs> Students view me as someone who inspires them. As a teacher of color, I am a change agent. So what does that tell you? Oh, sorry. Let me, let me back up. Oh, I hope I didn't get this out of order. Um, I think I got this out of order. Dispositions of star teachers, I'm just going to go on. Um, they embody respect. They embed social skills. They are inclusive. They alter the environment. They keep expectations high. They look at their students as stars. They make the content relevant, teach with powerful ideas, teach with efficacy, and use many avenues to learning. Ah, they did. I missed a slide. What does all this tell you? that Woodson was right, he's still right, that he's still relevant, right? What he said 85 years ago is still relevant. What I learned at Elms in 1993 is still relevant. Doesn't that make you angry? Where have we come? <laughs> Not very far, right? Two steps forward, one step back. All right. Who were your star teachers? Do you have any? Did you, did you have some star teachers? I think we all did. I think we all did. At classical high school, so I told you that I, um, born in, in, in New York, but raised in Massachusetts, so I went to classical high school when it was classical high school. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a, an honors English teacher. Her name was Mrs. Petersley. And she said to me, my last year at Elms, you know how you guys go back and you visit your teachers in high school. So my last year at Elms, she says to me, I go back and visit her. And she says, don't, you can go ahead and teach, but don't stay there, she said. Do something to change education. Be a superintendent, be a teacher educator, be a higher education administrator. Do something to change education. And so she saw possibility, right? There's, there's the slide that I wanted before. It got mixed up. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. I'm going to read that last one, that we need more star teachers who are homegrown and from the community. I see my sisters shaking their head, yes. What kind of equity do you want to see? What kinds of change in education do you wish and hope for? What kinds of injustices are you fighting? Who are you lifting as you climb? And who are you grooming to one day be able to pass the baton? So 
when um, the young lady introduced me, she sa said that I love portraiture, and so in portraiture is poetry. <coughs> I'm gonna leave this here for a moment, and then I'm just gonna read that last line. I'm sorry, the last stanza. You can't see it? So I don't know if you want to read it. So okay, I'll do that. The classroom sparkles on this avenue in a universe where liquor stores and bodegas surround each corner of a school in need of repair. There is a playground without swings or a jungle gym close to a plot of flowers budding from the seeds planted and cared for by students whose parents have two and three jobs and affordable care is not a given, teaching for social justice to earn a living. In an urban school or rural school, definitely high needs, these are committed teachers, stars, who see their students celebrate difference, develop minds, think critically to love community. They teach to change the world, and while it turns, these stars see continuous possibility. The classroom shines. With a teacher who educates efficaciously, using classroom as a site for change and agent, incorporating standards thoughtfully, regardless of external mandates, he teaches from experience, for experience, and towards experience. Project-based, backwards design, an alternative assessment exists daily to differentiate classroom content, process, and products. They illuminate for all students, despite the rhetoric of the system, their students excel, grow, glow, revolve, and evolve in this solar stars. Being about the students and building rapport, hope, restore, transform, star teachers do more then follow the guidelines, they invest their time and do so with a smile, knowing that every classroom is different, every student is unalike. Stars know that all can learn in a classroom that embraces everyone's <coughs> turn. Shine on. Can I get some clicks? <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna end here. I'm, I wish you all never-ending possibilities filled with hope, love, and justice, and Wakanda forever. And at this time, if anybody has a question, I will gladly take them. Please raise your hand. We have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Marie Claire. What would you say to a young person that's majoring in STEM and they're not quite sure what they would like to do, um, what direction they want to go into? Because I hear this a lot. So, um, my name is Phyllis. I'm the director of career um, development here at Elms College. So I, I get this a lot from a lot of different majors, but particularly in STEM. A lot of times they don't know how to narrow down what exactly they're interested in. So what encouragement would you offer um, students of color? So, you know, we, we get that a lot at the institution too. Well, but, so if I understand your question correctly, you're saying what would I say to them if they're interested in science but they're not sure which route to go into, right? Um, the ones that they do the, the the, they get the A's in the classes. <laughs> so um, biology, right? Um, math is always a good one. Um, we have a, a, a major at our institution called integrated math science. So it's a, it's, a, it's a major that doesn't take the hard, hard sciences. So students don't feel like they have to take you know, differential equations for math, so to speak, or they, right, they don't have to take, um, they can go up to organic chem and, and stop there. Um, because I think that's what, um, uh, it, it's what stops students from continuing on in the sciences, those hardcore um, science courses. So um, that is coupled with 
uh, that major is coupled with a, um, a certification that allows students to teach through middle school. So I would say to try to try to do elementary cert or middle school cert. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. yeah. All right, we have time for one more question. If somebody has a question. One last question. Okay, we have one over here. Thank you. Um, I'm a middle school teacher in a suburb that's dominantly white and Asian. Yes. And um, we do often do book clubs where we've read several of the books on your list. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, and we talk about it. Um, the problem is the majority of teachers are white. Yes. So <laughs> what advice do you have um, in addition to what was in those books as to how we can help um, spread diversity and equity for our students? Well, you know, I, I think the first thing in spreading diversity and equity is knowing um, that you need to do it and and having teachers be welcome to understanding their own privileges right and I think um, that's probably the, the, the first step maybe read something around uh, whiteness and I'm, I'm assuming that most of the teachers in your district are white yeah yeah um, read something around whiteness and around um, them investigating their own uh, as Peggy McIntosh calls it their own backpacks right and and that kind of um, that kind of privilege that they carry around and not necessarily know that they're carrying it the other thing that might be helpful is um, looking at uh, now that now the words escaping me give me a second it'll come back you know my 50 year old mind it'll come back give me a second <laughs> any other questions Yes. I have a great idea for a book. It just came out. White Fragility. Ah, thank by you. Robin D'Angelo. Great book. Yes. Thank you for that. I was just going to, going to recommend Robin. Yeah. But also Tim Wise. Tim um, Wise is very good. Yeah. Paul Gorski. Oh, yes. I know Paul. Yeah. Yes. He has a really good website, um, Multicultural Pavilion, that actually you can you can go on his website and take um, sort of these multicultural quizzes uh-huh and that's that's a fun way to start right yeah all right thank you everyone and thank you again dr hill please let's thank you. All right, at this time, we're going to transition into a short break. Um, there are food, refreshments, coffee um, out in the library well. I just ask that um, we remember it is a library still. Students might be studying. But let's give another round of applause to our first two speakers. <laughs> we'll reconvene here at about 2.50, 2.55. Let's give another round of applause for our first two speakers. One thing, um, I, I know Richard went first and I wanted him to say more about it, but his beautiful art is on, displayed on the wall here. So as he, as he mentioned, he's an artist. Um, his, his artwork is generously, I wish you would let us keep them, but <laughs> generously on display today. So um, if you get a chance, definitely ask uh, what some of these uh, paintings represent. So now I have the pleasure of introducing um, one of my mentees. Um, so Alyssa Mercado is a junior criminal justice major and currently serves as the vice president of the Diversity Leadership Council. She has a passion for social justice, which is why I recruited her last year, <laughs> um, and lives on the legacy of the Sisters of St. Joseph as an active role uh, in campus ministry. Alyssa will introduce our third speaker today. Our next speaker, Dr. Toussaint Lucier, is an assistant professor in the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Luzier holds a PhD in history from the University of Chicago with his research focusing on grassroots response, responses to the post-war emergence of mass incarceration in Chicago. 
At, the, at UMass Amherst, he teaches courses on African American history, black politics, criminal justice policy, and transnational social movements. His articles and essays have been published in Seoul's Radical History Review, the Journal of Urban History, Against the Current, and Left Turn Magazine. He is co-author of Rethinking the American Prison Movement with Dan Berger, and is pres presently the part, sorry, preparing a book manuscript titled War for the City, Black Chicago and the Rise of the Carceral State. He has been recognized as a, as a University of Chicago Century Fellow, a Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellow, a Mellon Mays Dissertation Fellow, and a University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Fellow. It is my honor and privilege to welcome someone with as deep-rooted focus in social justice as Dr. Luzier to the stage today. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Mercado, for the obituary, as, as we're calling it today. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming um, and staying with us. Um, there's always this weird thing when you plan events and you allow a break in the middle of it, and you don't know if everybody's going to come back. But I think the fact that everybody seems to have come back, and I think we might have added a few people, I think speaks to the, um, the caliber of the discussion that's been had thus far. And um, <clears throat> to that end, I want to thank all the uh, staff here at Elms College and all the folks who had a hand in planning this event. I very much appreciate the invitation and um, very much interested in um, sharing some of my own research and reflections on sort of where we are at this moment in time um, and hearing your thoughts and opinions. And I say that in part because um, I am trained as a historian um, but I'm someone who, as uh, even from that scholarly perspective, um, thinks that history and the study of history is, um, is essential, um, not so that we can know the names and dates of uh, when particular events took place, but so that we can better understand where we are today. And I've always tried to understand history as really something that can give us a guide for understanding our current moment. Um, and so, what I'd like to share with you is um, my understanding of where we are at this moment in time, particularly when it comes to matters of criminal justice and more specifically mass incarceration, and um, how um, a historical perspective can help inform um, uh, what we can make of the current moment and how we can best uh, move towards a greater sense of social justice and social equity. On the morning of January 8th, 2019, Desmond Meade sat down inside of the Orange County Supervisor's election office in Orlando, Florida, and fought back tears as he filled out a, vo a voter registration form. Flanked by his wife and three of his five children, Meade smiled as he completed a process that restored the voting rights he had legally forfeited following a felony conviction on drug-related offenses in the early 2000s. Describing himself as no longer a second-class citizen, Meade joined, Mead joined dozens of others who were some of the first formerly incarcerated people to regain a right that by law, a felony or serious criminal conviction had previously barred them from exercising. In doing so, these white, Latino, and primarily black men and women became the face of the lar one of the largest expansions of enfranchisement since women's suffrage in the early 1900s, as nearly 1.5 million people with felony records became el eligible to vote in Florida, the nation's third largest state. Florida now served as an example of how quickly long-standing, quote, tough on crime policies could be swept away, in many ways marking the brave new world of criminal justice reform we find ourselves in today. This watershed moment is a direct outcome of the most recent midterm elections, as a majority of Florida voters approved Amendment 4, a ballot measure to automatically restore the right to vote to those found guilty of a felony crime. 
Nearly every state denies those in prison the right to vote. Some prohibit voting only until a person also finishes their term of parole or probation. However, Florida has been one of a handful of states that has banned anyone convicted of a felony crime from exercising the right to vote, even after completion of their sentence and a return to society. Indeed, unless someone re released from prison could gain a special waiver from the governor, they face the prospects of not being able to vote for the rest of their lives. By most estimates, this legalized form of voter disenfranchisement impacted a little over 9% of the state's voting age population. With stark racial disparities in arrest and incarceration, this practice of felony disenfranchisement left over 418,000 black people, or 18% of potential black voters in Florida, unable to vote in spite of the fact that they had completed their sentences and paid their proverbial debt to society. Far from a new phenomenon, Florida's felony disenfranchisement law is 150 years, was 150 years old, a product of a post-Civil War period when plantation elites in states across the South designed seemingly colorblind laws to undermine the civil rights and political power of freedmen and women. While it did not prevent Reconstruction governments from taking office, these laws would remain on the books, playing a key role in denying voting rights to African Americans amidst the heyday of Jim Crow uh, segregation. Most recently, this law was at the center of the political turmoil surrounding the presumed victory of Republican presidential candidate George W. Bush in 2000. At the time, George W.'s brother, Jeb Bush, had been a popular Florida governor, and his officials had used the corrupt enforcement of this law as a pretext by which to deem nearly 58,000 registered voters, many of them African Americans, ineligible to cast a ballot. While it garnered few headlines, this racist disenfranchisement scheme helped us secure Bush's official victory by a few hundred votes. At the same time, it also sparked a decade long, decades long effort led by formerly imprisoned men and women to amend the state's constitution, first through the courts and legislatures, and when those failed to succeed, uh, ultimately through a ballot measure. Under the leadership of Meade, Desmond Meade, who I mentioned earlier, and others uh, directly impacted, a broad coalition of organized organizations collected at least 766,000 signatures to get the Voting Rights Restoration for Felons Initiative on the ballot and then launched a door-to-door -door campaign to increase public support of it. While the state's Democratic gubernatorial candidate touted this initiative, it also received support from across the political spectrum with endorsements ranging from the liberal American Civil Liberties Union to the conservative Freedom Partners, a Koch Brothers-backed organization. This broad coalition of support ultimately helped the initiative to win the support of some 64% of midterm voters. Due to the hard work of these and other groups, anyone convicted of a felony crime, except in the case of a murder or sex offense, will have their right, voting rights automatically restored once they complete the term of their sentence, a signal vi victory that in many ways illustrates the paradoxes of this current moment of criminal justice reform. Although rarely the focus of public discussion, it is clear that we are in the midst of a unique moment marked by the possibility of reform, whether changes to this nation's, where changes to this nation's broken criminal justice system are being considered in a way that they have not been for more than three decades. Across the country, policies related to nearly every aspect of the system are being taken up and implemented from questions of police oversight and cash bail to criminal sentencing and prison education. These policy changes are attempting to address long-standing inequities in a broader system that has for decades left the United States the world's leader in incarceration. Rather than a feature of liberal blue states or the exclusion of more conservative red states, these reforms have been increasingly ecumenical in their impact. At a time, uh, at a time filled with harsh partisan bickering, the reforms have routinely been the product of bipartisan lawmaking. Demands once a purview of all volunteer grassroots organizations continue to gain support of large organizations and public interest groups. Yet the paradox of these reform efforts is that while they have continued to sweep across the country, they have, been routinely re they have routinely reflected a nagging set of contradictions. While their implementation has often made a nod to the stark racial inequities of our criminal justice system, rarely have these reforms addressed the problem of the system's institutional racism um, head on. Instead, these reforms have tended to skirt the issue, while at the same time implementing cuts, uh, uh, cutouts to these reforms that have left untouched notably, uh, notable constituencies. Recall Amendment 4 and its historic restoration of voting rights, except for those convicted of a murder or a sex offense. 
In case after case, similar categorical exceptions have been characteristic of these reform efforts. Perhaps it, be, it should be no surprise that Massachusetts helped to lay the foundation for this practice. In 2010, the state passed a law mandating crucial and much needed reforms to its criminal offender records information, or CORI database. Originally developed as a means of sharing case information between police officers and court officials, this database eventually became a means by which the members of the public, be they employers, insurance agencies, college admissions officers, or bank loan officers, could, uh, could use it to inquire about an individual's history of court arraignments. These histories of court involvement, or quarries, would be provided regardless of whether or not these arraignments had even resulted in a conviction, in effect turning all such histories into a life, senten life sentences that facilitated a wholly legal form of discrimination, often weighted against people of color. After years of protest by grassroots organizations, legal experts, and other public interest groups, as well as acknowledgement by law enforcement officials themselves that court reform would, event, would actually help to improve public safety. Um, these reform efforts gained traction and led to a law that limited the amount of information on a court, uh, sorry, limited the amount of information on the quarry and barred employers from asking about criminal history on a job application, uh, otherwise known as the banned box provision. Crucially, the reform simplified the process of having one's quarry sealed and shortened the time period before this could occur, except for murder, manslaughter, and sex offenses. Exempted from the reform, these would remain on file. Eight years after Amendment 4, Massachusetts groundbreaking quarry reform set, um, eight years, sorry, eight years before Amendment 4, Massachusetts groundbreaking quarry reform set in place cutouts or exceptions that limited the breadth of its impact undercutting the promise of social equity its proponents often voiced and helping to set a trend that state after state continues to follow. This trend is even reflected in the recent, recently signed First Step Act, a bill that has garnered significant press attention. Much like Florida's Amendment 4 and Massachusetts Corey reform, this law was a product of a bipartisan um, effort with unlikely bedfellows like the Families Against Mandatory Minimums in the American Conservative Union lobbying for its passage. Similarly, both champions and opponents of criminal justice reform came together to help move this bill through Congress, largely due to the involvement of Special Advisor Jared Kushner, a White, ha uh, a White House that had once declared itself a proponent of a 21st century version of law and order politics set against the backdrop of our own quote unquote American carnage, signaled its support for this reform in a manner that made its passage possible. In its final form, the First Step Act provided for key changes in criminal sentencing that undercut the mandatory minimum framework, um, particularly for repeat offenders and those convicted of drug-related crimes that had long been a key feature of the tough on crime era. Additionally, it also made modest changes to the management of the federal prison system, authorizing more funding for rehabilitative programming, strengthening the policy of compassionate release for sick and elderly people, making it possible for prisoners to get time off for their sentences, for good behavior, um, as uh, excuse me, as Matthew Charles, who uh, was a guest um, at the State of the Union address, um, as his uh, quite recent release indicated, and um, 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 and but while salutary, these correctional reforms also enumerated multiple sentences that would make an individual ineligible for receiving the benefit of these policy changes, not only a murder or a sex offense but also any sort of gun crime conviction, even if it had not been a violent one. In some sense, this continued reliance on exemptions should not be surprising as they in some ways reflect the public mood. While voters are increasingly apt to back criminal justice reform, there remains a significant disparity in regards to public support when those who will be seen as benefiting from these efforts have a violent as opposed to a nonviolent criminal past. Thus, these inequities in public policy have a substantial degree of public support. Yet the logic behind these exemptions, that those who commit crim uh, violent crimes or sex offenses are inherently deviant and prone to future acts of violence, um, stand in sharp contrast to, grow to the growing nonviolent movement for criminal justice reform that has been emerging within the nation's prisons themselves. For more than a decade, prisoners across the country have participated in a host of strikes, building takeovers, and other forms of protest. On December 2010, just months after our quarry reforms went into effect, prisoners in Georgia launched a, st a statewide work strike after secretly coordinating their efforts using contraband cell phones. Planned as a one-day strike, this protest caught officials by surprise. 
Organizers issued a set of nine demands, including a living wage for work, increased educational opportunities, decent health care, uh, decent living conditions, vocational training, greater access to family members, and more just parole decisions. Despite these initial plans, the strike would continue for six days as prison officials responded by locking down entire prisons, cut off hot water, confiscated cell phones, and transferred suspected strike organizers to different facilities. In several cases, guards pepper sprayed and tear gas strikers indiscriminately, then beat those who, uh, who were ultimately identified as strike leaders. Other strikes and uprisings have broken out in prisons and immigrant detention centers in Alabama, Ohio, North Carolina, Texas, Washington, West Virginia, and elsewhere. The biggest occurred at California's Pelican Bay, one of the nation's first supermax prisons. There, prisoners staged three hunger strikes between 2011 and 2013, protesting long-term solitary confinement. At its height in 2013, 30,000 incarcerated people throughout the state of California joined in support of the leadership Collect, the leadership's collective's five demands. The strike yielded a, a legal settlement that removed almost all California incarcerated people from long-term isolation. It also produced a historic statement calling for multiracial unity, itself produced by black, Chicano, and white prisoners who authorities claim constituted leaders of rival gangs. Their success undermined the historic racial divisions of California's prisons, suggesting new opportunities for, uni for unity amongst incarcerated people. On September 9th, 2016, an estimated 24,000 prisoners began what would become the largest prison strike in U.S. history. Called for by the prison-based Free Alabama Movement and scheduled to coincide with the 45th anniversary of New York's famous Attica Rebellion, the strike would quickly spread to, uh, to more than 29 prisons across 12 states. In the years prior, FAM organizers had cut their teeth by leading a series, a series of strikes hostage takings, and other protests that had shaken the Alabama prison system and prompted calls for prison reform. Rather than a, a cohesive list of demands, grievances driving the national prison strike varied from state to state, and strike activities continued for up to three weeks. The Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee, a product of the um, Industrial Workers of the World, a militant labor union, played a key role in providing outside support. While several key prison organizers would be targeted for repression, this strike demonstrated the emergence of a movement seeking to engage prisoners and outside supporters on a national scale. Indeed, in the months leading up to the midterm elections in 2016, um, and Florida's amendment, Florida's amendment 4 campaign received a boost from a nearly three-week prison strike launched by jailhouse lawyers speak, a network of imprisoned legal advocates and prisoner organizers. In 2018, National prison strike demanded the recognition of the voting rights of not just the men and women who had completed their sentences, but also those who remained behind bars, many of them with violent convictions. In doing so, it highlights the rising pace of organizing behind bars and the emergence of a movement dedicated to the long-term long struggle of winning an end to incarceration, one reform at a time. JLS announced its strike just days after the deadliest prison riot in the past 20, 25 years, and included a list of demands that addressed issues at the root of the recent outbreak of prisoner on prisoner violence. Men and women incarcerated in prisons across the nature declare a nationwide strike in response to the riot in Lee Correctional Institution, a maximum security prison in South Carolina, JLS stated in an April 2018 press release. Seven comrades lost their life during a, a senseless uprising that could have been avoided had the prison not been overcrowded from the greed wrought by mass incarceration and the lack of respect for human life that is embedded in our nation's penal ideology. These demands called for immediate improvements in prison conditions, access to educational opportunities behind bar, bars, and a fair pay, fair pay instead of prison slavery for prisoners who work behind bars. Rather than skirting around issues of institutional racism, JLS also demanded an end to racist and punitive federal and criminal sentencing laws and parole policies that kept prisoners behind bars for longer periods of time. Denied them access to rehabilitative, rehabilitative programs and printed, prevented them from being released early, often because of their crime or their alleged gang affiliation. Finally, the list included the repeal of the 1996 Prisoner Litigation Reform Act, a federal law that has made it more difficult for prisoners to petition the courts uh, over, the uh, over the denial of their rights, as well as an end to the legalized disenfranchisement of both people held in prison and those who have completed their sentences. 
without the sort of exemptions that have, been, that have become the norm of recent reform efforts. To win these reforms, JLS encouraged prisoners to engage in different forms of nonviolent protests, from labor and hunger strikes to sit-ins and commissary boycotts. While it officially eschewed the use of violence, the strike also steeped itself in the legacy of the 1970s era radical prison movement. JLS's announcement, for instance, called for these protests to begin on August 21st, the anniversary of the 1971 assassination of prison intellectual and revolutionary organizer George Jackson, and ending on September 9th, the start of the iconic 1971 Attica prison uprising. While correctional officials routinely denied that any protests were taking place, JLS's strike call reached at least 16 states and federal prisons and guarded unprecedented community support and mainstream media coverage. In the months since the strike, prison organizers have continued to push for their outside supporters to develop local cam campaigns around specific demands. This approach includes efforts like the recently launched Right to Vote campaign as tactics oriented towards the ultimate objective of building a prisoner-led abolitionist movement. Quote, ending U.S. disenfranchisement laws across the board should be a human rights stance, a JLS member wrote on Twitter in the weeks leading up to the recent election. Quote, organizing to end the practice is a tactic that can further destabilize prison slavery in this country. As criminal justice reform moves closer to the mainstream of public discussion, it remains to be seen whether the more practical reform efforts gaining traction across the country will come into more uh, direct conversation with the movement being developed by JLS, Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, and other prisoner organizations who have vowed not simply to seek out piecemeal changes, but to, put these, put, uh, to push these reforms to their limits in the direction of ultimately abolishing rather than simply reforming our nation's mass incarceration system. Thank you. So I will now open the floor to uh, anyone who wanted to ask any questions. The, what happened in Florida with the re restoration of voting rights for uh, nonviolent former um, um, uh, convicted um, individuals, mm -hmm. do you see that as a watershed moment or mm -hmm. do you see that as a one-time event or wh wh how do you see the trajectory of that <coughs> for voting rights of former um, in incarcerated individuals in the United States? Sure. Um, so to the question of the significance of the um, Amendment 4 campaign in Florida, uh, it's definitely a historic development. Uh, and as you can see by the, um, the slide that I showed in terms of the number of, um, uh, the percentage of African Americans nationally in Florida who were disenfranchised um, by that, um, by the felony disenfranchisement law, it's incredibly significant. I think the thing that is uh, interesting is while there's been some discussion of um, kind of modeling similar reform efforts in other states after what took place in Florida. Um, there's, there's such a difference in terms of how voting rights are, uh, how changes to voting rights can be made on a state-by-state -state basis that it's more difficult to model the same sort of practice that took place in Florida um, in other states. What is being sort of discussed and taken up as a model is the First Step Act that was passed on a federal level. Uh, there are now about five states, including Florida, that are considering local versions of the sort of First Step Act and trying to sort of use um, some of the modest reforms that that legislation has as um, ways to implement and address both um, issues related to how prisons are managed as well as uh, questions of sentencing reform. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, is anything being done, um, or your opinion on the part about FAFSA, the financial aid form? There's a there's a segment on there that says, "Have you been convicted?" I believe it's possession of marijuana or a misdemeanor. And sometimes I know with students, they're a little apprehensive. They want to be truthful, but also in the same sense, this may block their aid, and then they may not you know, be able to go to school. So, um, so I haven't heard anything in terms of uh, like reform efforts directly related to FAFSA. What is in the offing in a more significant way is efforts to um, make it possible for um, folks who have 
been incarcerated or formerly incarcerated to have access to Pell Grants, which is something that was eliminated by some of the criminal justice legislation that was put in place during uh, the mid-1990s during the Clinton administration. And um, that has an orientation towards trying to increase um, maybe not access to loans, like through FAFSA or sort of financial aid, but through um, at least um, federal assistance in terms of um, grants and what have you for college. And uh, for many who, are, uh, who work around the intersection of prisons and education, the opportunity to, to kind of use the expansion of college education into prisons um, as a sort of form of rehabilitative programming is uh, something that's um, kind of uh, sort of a hot topic of discussion um, because uh, as it stands now, without that sort of, um, without that sort of uh, legislative reform, uh, that sort of funding isn't available, uh, particularly for individuals who are looking to receive um, college credit or uh, even try to attain a degree. Your quarry sealed after eight years. Yeah. To go back to the question that was just asked, how do you answer that question on your passport? Um, what what uh, people, sorry, what legal experts have recommended is for, for folks who have uh, criminal records to always be truthful, right? When they're uh, dealing with um, uh, conversations with a potential employer, what have you. Um, the main focus of the quarry reform effort that took place in 2020, sorry, 2010, was to um, at least get, and this was something that people who, had, who were formerly incarcerated were really advocating for, to have the opportunity to have that conversation. Because what they were finding before that was um, there would be a quarry check and they would, the response would come back and that would completely eliminate them from the pile. And so they wanted the opportunity to at least be able to go in and say, look, Yes, uh, you know, I committed this mistake in, in my youth or I paid my debt to society and let that be the case as opposed to simply saying, um, uh, you know, I'm not even going to get an interview or a due consideration just because this came up and it wasn't even a conviction, right? It might have been I was arrested and, the, um, you know, I was found not guilty in the case or what have you, but simply coming up when that Corey records check came was, was put in process. Um, really was a hindrance in many ways for um, a number of folks who are formerly incarcerated. Hi, I'm not sure if it's more of a comment um, or, or a question, I guess, followed by a comment. And um, as you're talking about this, and I'm thinking about the impact that this could have on students coming out incarcerated, particularly black and brown men, mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking at the rate of recidivism, mm -hmm. and I wonder how much of this may have an impact or could potentially impact them if they're trying to apply to come to school, get themselves rehabilita uh, rehabilitated, yeah. um, and then we have this barrier. Mm -hmm. And so can you speak a little bit about the impact of that, if there is one? Um, and I'm thinking more in terms of recidivism, mm -hmm. you know, going back, going back. Um, how do we stop that? And when you say impact, are you talking about the issues related to quarries, or are you talking about the education? The education yeah. piece, if they're applying for FAFSA and yeah. there's a potential barrier, yeah. um, they can get Pell Grants, which yeah. is the part of the uh, Supplemental Opportunity Grants. Yeah. But as far as loans, which mm -hmm. a lot of our, and community colleges yeah. particularly, yeah. they depend very heavily on those loans. So if students are being denied that, yeah. you know, then you're looking at them losing their um, self-worth. Yep. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so then they go back out. You know, they're they're not good enough to get into the college sure. and get the education to get reform to contribute to the community. Sure. So now, does this you know put a rise mm -hmm. in in uh, their their criminal activity? Whether it could have been it could have been a misdemeanor. Sure. You know, but because they served time for that, I'm just wondering how much of an impact that would have on the rate of recidivism uh, for, like I said, particularly our black and brown men because yeah. working in a community college, I don't see enough of them in there. Yeah, no, I would say that um, across the board, uh, so there's a, the way that our criminal justice system operates now, um, we have like a, I don't know if you guys, it's easier with the mic or not, but across the board, we have a significant problem with recidivism. About one in the sort of standard statistic 
that people cite is that about one in every three people who's released from prison uh, will, at some point, within a three-year period, recidivate, will we'll go back to prison. Um, and that's oftentimes because of really the lack of opportunities that they face on the outside um, and the way that prison is structured in such a way that makes it difficult for people to, uh, people who have been incarcerated, not only to adjust to life on the outside, but to really rebuild their lives, because in many ways that's, that's what's in the offing. And um, oftentimes education is seen as the number one uh, like positive factor that could make it uh, likely for somebody to not recidivate. Um, obviously, family support, uh, employment opportunity, you're talking about a lot of different things, but education is seen as like a really um, key um, determinant in terms of preventing somebody from, from uh, being in a situation where uh, they could either be, uh, get criminally involved again or they could be violated for their parole or all host of things that make it likely for somebody to go back to prison. Um, and as I said, I haven't heard about um, efforts to address the FAFSA issue in particular, but I think if there's one thing that you, can t you should take away from this presentation is that um, we are really in a, uh, I think from my perspective, an exciting moment in terms of, uh, with all the paradoxes it entails, um, a moment in terms of being able to change the way those kind of policies operate. So I would see, especially with the first step back just being passed the federal level, I would see there being a much more of an openness at this moment in time, as opposed to where we were five, 10 years ago, in terms of something like that being, at, to the degree that it's, it's a part of the FAFSA application, being reconsidered and possibly taken out of it. Thank you. No problem. We have time for one more question. So Massachusetts is a really weird example because prior to 2000, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not from Massachusetts, I've lived here for a little while, but prior to 2000, uh, individuals in the, um, in the prison system in Massachusetts actually had the right to vote. It was one of only a handful of states, I think uh, Maine and, um, I get the two confused, I'm sorry, I think Maine and um, New Hampshire are one of the other two states that are able, where people who are incarcerated have the opportunity to vote while they're in prison. And it was actually a ballot measure that stripped um, uh, uh, folks who were imprisoned of the right to vote. And there is, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, legislation that's being considered at this moment to, um, <coughs> to, uh, to unwind that, to make it possible for um, individuals who are currently incarcerated to vote. Um, and there's also some efforts to really um, not simply wait on the state house to kind of move that forward, but you have an, several different um, kind of grassroots organizations that are trying to organize to really um, find ways to make it easier for uh, formerly incarcerated people to avoid some of those legal hurdles. But at the moment, at this moment in time, cause kind of Massachusetts is in the unique position of um, living with the after effects of the opposite of what happened in Florida. Right? Instead of there having been a constitutional amendment uh, ballot measure that restored the right to vote in 2000, that uh, right to vote was taken away. And just, I would just want to note, um, people who are in jail um, have the right to vote. Um, it's something that's not often acknowledged, and sometimes there are voting, voter registration drives that take place in, in jails, but people who are in jail have the right to vote, and then once folks have completed their uh, pro sorry, uh, parole and probation sentences, parts of their sentences, um, uh, at least in Massachusetts, those vote voting rights are restored. All right, let's give a round of applause for our Dr. Lucia. That was fantastic. Uh, I learned a lot there. <laughs> um, up next, I will invite a true gem um, of this campus up to the stage, Jason Hosey. Uh, is a first year student here at Elms College studying entrepreneurial leadership in the business program. He doesn't know it yet, but I'm um, slowly recruiting him to be a part of Diversity Leadership Council, so just letting you know. <laughs> um, but Jason will be introducing our fourth and final speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
so now I feel like I'm really on the spot. Um, thank you, Elena, so much. Um, so last but certainly not least, I have the pleasure of, of introducing a Western Massachusetts powerhouse. Uh, Shirley Edgerton serves as cultural proficiency coach for Pittsfield Public Schools. Uh, Edgerton holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from Herbert Lehman College uh, in New York and a master of education degree in educational leadership and administration from the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in North Adams. Uh, she previously served as a trustee at MCLA on the steering committee of the Berkshire Pro uh, Priorities Literacy Project. Uh, she founded the Women of Color Giving Circle uh, and the Rites of Passage and Empowerment Program, a holistic girls mentoring program that includes college tours and international service learning projects. Additionally, Shirley co-founded the Arts Festival Lift Every Voice, celebrating African-American culture and heritage. She has served on numerous boards, including the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts and currently the Berkshire Children and Family Center. Uh, Shirley, ha uh, Shirley was the honorary degree recipient at last year's Elms College uh, uh, commencement ceremonies for her work as an educator, community activist, and visionary. Please join me in welcoming Shirley Edgerton to the stage. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ah, I think I'm going to take him with me. <laughs> So I've been given all types of instructions here. Let's see. Um, I'm the, uh, let me see, baseball player, three players, the base is full, and it's my responsibility to bring everybody home. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I, um, I, I just have to thank the president and uh, the incredible director for this opportunity to share today. Uh, it has been a wonderful afternoon, so much knowledge. Um, what a pleasant lunch. Um, I'll travel to the Elms anytime for a beautiful lunch. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your, your president is always such a, a, a great host. Um, so, um, and I also hold this, this institution in high esteem. Um, as you heard, I'm, I'm very focused on the community. I pay attention to the work that systems and institutions are doing, particularly in Massachusetts. And I'm honored to be associated with, uh, with this incredible higher education institution. So, equity and justice, shifting the blame. There are numerous definitions for equity. But for the purpose of this presentation, we will use the following definitions from Stanford's Social Innovation Review. It states, equity is about each of us getting what we need to survive or succeed, access to opportunity, networks, resources, and supports based on where we are and where we want to go. Nanette Sykes at the Annie Casey Foundation thinks of it as each of us reaching our full potential. History teaches us the intentionality of inequity in our society. The system of class has been a concept early in, the, in American history, the lowest level of being uh, black Americans, poor whites, and the elites. In 1854, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the chapter, Poor White, I'm not gonna use the word, in her book, A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Stowe wrote that slavery not only produces degraded, miserable slaves, but also poor whites who are even more degraded and miserable. Here we are, 2019, having the discussions questioning equity and justice. We can safely conclude that the systematic barriers of oppression socially, economically, environmentally, educationally still exist. Our own Berkshire native, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, predicted in 1903 that the issue of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. He has been proven correct. Policies and practices and systems perpetuate the inequities 
and injustices and systems that impact lives daily of marginalized groups. For generations, society or systems have blamed individuals or under-resourced households for their lack of success. In 1965, Daniel Patrick Monaghan, an American sociologist serving as Assistant Secretary of Labor under President Lyndon Johnson wrote what is known as the Monaghan Report. Do you remember that? <laughs> the Negro Family, the Case for National Action. In 1976, he was elected to the first of several terms as the United States Senator from New York and continued to support liberal programs to, to try to end poverty. His report focused on the deep roots of black poverty in the United States and concluded with much controversy that the high rate of families headed by single mothers would greatly, would greatly hinder progress of blacks towards economic and political equality. Monaghan argued that the rise in black single mother families was caused not by a lack of jobs, but by a destructive, quote, vain and ghetto culture, end of quote, which could be traced to slavery and continued discrimination in the American South under Jim Crow. From the introduction of this report, African Americans, the NACP, and other civil rights organizations and leaders such as Reverend Jesse Jackson, Reverend Al Sharpton rebuked this report. They strongly suggested that Monaghan relied both on stereotypes of the black family and black men, implying that blacks had inferior academic performance, portrayed crime and pathologies as endemic to the black community and failing to recognize that cultural bias and racism in standard tests had contributed to the apparent lower achievement by blacks in schools. In 1971, psychologist William Ryan coined the phrase, blaming the victim, especially as a critique of the Monaghan Report. He said it was an attempt to divert responsibility for poverty from social structure factor to the behaviors and cultural patterns of the poor. Today, the ideal of of equal opportunity is upheld by our laws and universally embraced in our politics. A large and stable black middle class has emerged and black participation in economic, political, and cultural life of this country at every level and in every venue has expanded impressively. And this is good news. But yet in the 21st century, African Americans have suffered disproportionate unemployment rates. Poverty level has been equal to the 1960s and social and judicial discrimination have resulted in people of color having the highest rate of incarceration, which we just heard about so effectively. To add to this national dialogue, nearly 20 million immigrants have arrived on our shores mostly from non-European points of origin. Latinos are the growing number, a nation's largest ethnic minority group. Asian American college students and urban entrepreneurs are more numerous and more important in this country's economic and political life than ever before. But it's time to shift the blame. As I interact with students and the young women of the Rights and Passage Mentoring Program, many of them have been victimized by the systems of oppression. Some are angry, traumatized, lack self-worth, and are depressed. The education gap, stripping of black culture, lack of knowledge of history, school underfunding, discipline disparities, in kindergarten through 12th grade schools are systematic barriers that continue to contribute to their sense of hopelessness. They are not to blame. In the Rites of Passage program, we provide trusting relationships, consistency, 
high expectations, role modeling, guidance, inspiration, and more to attempt to level the playing field. The results are astonishing. For an example, a young woman that was homeless with questionable grades in her junior and senior years of college is now on the dean's list, living in an honors dorm at a four years college. Another young woman who stopped dreaming of attending college because of the lack of resources will graduate from a four year institute with honors in May 2018 because we found an entrepreneur that invested in her future. We have another young woman from a single female household that graduated from a four year institution in 2018. She's now on a fellow in South Africa doing research representing a prestigious university. Instead of our systems focusing the failure on youth and often underserved families and ask for changes in their behavior, it is time for more of our institutions that govern our society to become critically aware, have conversations like we're having today, and to begin to contemplate, ch contemplate changes in the systems. Racial hierarchy must be systematically recognized. Those, of, those with privilege, many have become allies to this work to make these systematic changes. But the lack of teachers of color in our school system is problematic. 80% of our students are of color and 40% of the teachers are of color. The school to prison pipeline must be destroyed. The disproportionate number of young people of color being incarcerated because of harsh school policies they're branded, and now children are destroyed, and their hopes die for the future. How can they be expected to pull themselves up by their bootstraps if they don't have boots? The controversial conversation of reparations from slavery may need to be had. It is time to shift the blame and responsibility to ensure all systematic barriers are removed. In closing, I'm reminded of the words again of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. You can tell he's a favorite. <laughs> what a world this would be when human possibilities are freed, when we discover each other, when the stranger is no longer the potential criminal and the certain inferior. Thank you. There's my tech. All right, my tech is working now. I know we have questions. Question. But you mentioned reparations. Yes. And I'm wondering what suggestions you might offer as a remedy. What contributions or what um, form would you envision reparations taking? Mm hmm. Well, there are certainly uh, universities that are currently providing funds for descendants of slaves. So there, there needs to be, in my opinion, there needs to, to be conversations with these systems. There, there, there needs to be an upswell from, the, from grassroots. I'm a grassroots person. Um, and we need to begin to promote more conversations to come up with plans how we can ensure those who were promised the mule and 12 acres that somehow that they're just 40, 40 acres. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> that somehow that will be um, that that will be remedied. Um, so I think it's, a, it's about organizing, I think it's about pushing the conversation, and I think there's various ways that that can occur. But I agree with a lot of the speakers here today that education is one of um, our key uh, points um, to utilize to make changes in our society, and having th these universities to um, be focused and be very intentional like the President said to us at lunch today to, you know, to ensure that they're intentional about being inclusive 
and reaching out to those students who may not have the opportunity or the access for a higher education. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's a list, but that's fine. I can. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I'll definitely sit with you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> A great question, thank you. Yes, Are there, there, there's another question. I have one. Okay. So I'm a volunteer in the Springfield Public Schools. Ah, excellent. Uh, a, a product of the public schools, went to the, the military, uh, came out, went to the workforce, and now I'm a uh, first year non-traditional student. Um, I'm always talking to the at-risk the at youth. And I think, um, you know, as a parent, uh, the, 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 uh, the restoration efforts begin at home. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend that we attack the home front to let people know that one uh, restoration is even possible, and and how would we guide them along a path toward um, toward finding the restoration or toward achieve the achievement of restoration within the uh, the, the families? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I've learned with working with uh, the young women in the community is that often the parents failed an educational system. So they often don't know how to maneuver the maze of the educational system. So we find um, reaching out to the families, like in our group we have what we call a family engagement person. So before we have a young woman to officially join our group, we have this clinician um, to go and have a meeting, usually with the mother, and, um, and we have developed plans how to engage that parent as well as that daughter. So we're not, so that child is not leaving that parent behind. That, so unofficially, even though there's nothing in black and white suggesting that we're providing any supports or assistance to the parent, we really are. We're, like when we travel internationally, we extend that opportunity to the parent because we understand that there are a lot of parents who haven't left the Berkshires. So for them to have an international experience with their daughter, it's, it's just unimaginable. So we're very conscious of the fact that a lot of the parents may not have the skills, even though they want to. One of the things I drastically dislike hearing in the school system is parents don't care. They care. I, 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 thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's rare to come upon a parent that does not care about the well-being of his, his or her child. Very rare. But if, if there's a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, not knowing how to operate in these systems, then I think part of your, part of your, your mission has to be to engage that parent. Hi. Yes. Thank you for, um, for your presentation, you and the other presenters, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the Moynihan Report, and you alluded to institutionalized racism. Yes. And the uh, realities around um, students and parents and families' inability to navigate these systems. Yes. How would you, and, and as a result, I think that they are, um, many are reluctant to embrace or even engage the systems. Absolutely. So with regard to destigmatizing that engagement, that navigation process, what would you offer to folks to talk to younger individuals about uh, not being intimidated by the realities of these systems mm -hmm. and being encouraged to engage them? Well, I think relationships, there are two sides, sometimes more than that, to a relationship. So I think in, in one of the, my roles is the cultural proficiency coach for the Pittsfield Public Schools is I do training with the educators in cultural competency. So I, the, the, the hope and the plan per the superintendent of school committee is to begin to, sh to shift the environment. So when parents come in who are uncomfortable, who have maybe have not been successful in the system, that it, it, the environment feels more welcoming. I also think that the system has to do um, some untraditional outreach. 
you know? Sometimes, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that it has increased. Teachers are calling home to say, um, Jose had a great day today. You know, it's not always a phone call to say, you know, your child is failing, your child is behind, your child is a behavior problem. So there's an effort, you know, to engage parents with positives and to also, you know, to make them feel like there's more care and concern for, for their child. So I think it's a combination of things. But I, 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 I deeply believe that the school systems have a responsibility to educate the educators on cultural competency. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. I think, I, I, I think we need to start by condemning it because it's wrong. That's something that definitely it's it should it should be talked about in every home because that's something that's not it, when you're going against the color or any color in any society, to me it's not God wouldn't want something like that and it should be condemned. Completely. Absolutely. You're, you're saying racism should yeah. be condemned. Yeah, yeah absolutely. A absolutely. It yeah. should be talked about and it should, mm -hmm. it should be the knowledge inside the home. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, yes, I think that it, it, it has to be a discussion in the home, but I think every system and institution in our country has a responsibility to have that training and understanding and conversation. It's not a one way street and it's not a one way relationship. It's, it's, it's both parties involved. Have to do some changing, shifting, learning, you know, developing compassion and, and so on. Oops, sorry. <laughs> looking at the time, okay. okay. Uh, so, oh, um, okay. What's your um, view? All of you are phenomenal, just want to say, learned so much. I'm but sorry? infrastructure, mm -hmm. infrastructure and how our communities are designed, um, education and, you know, medically, our medical system, how does, how does that, tie into racism and whiteness. And when we look at how our communities are really working, mm -hmm. I just always feel that infrastructure, just the way we're separated and segregated into these, to these pockets of communities keeps people in, mm -hmm. keeps people out, um, and it interferes with our education, interferes with how we uh, obtain services. Yes. Um, it just truly, I just feel, inf so infrastructure, what do you think of? Well, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, that's why I talked about things uh, from a historical pr perspective first, because I don't think it's an accident that the systems, that there are some systems um, that uh, make it extremely challenging for us to be successful, whether it's education, whether it's, you know, getting good health care. Um, um, let's, let's see, what else is there? I mean, even the military. I mean, there's nothing that's, that has not been impacted by the isms. You know, so you're, you're absolutely right. And, and that's why I believe um, that it has to be systematic. Yes, as individuals, we need to be self-reflective. We need to be conscious. We need to be culturally competent. But systems, policies have to be examined. Practices have to be examined. So I absolutely agree with you. I don't want to go over my time. Shirley, thank you so much okay. for your contribution. Right. Let's give it a round of applause. I'll just um, want to remind everyone, although we are um, running on time, we do still have the optional debrief. So if any of you are still interested in coming after the symposium or the summit, um, you're more than welcome to debrief and discuss a lot more uh, than what we've had the time to today. 
Uh, it's depending on how many people say it might be in this room, but we also have the room across the hall reserved and it's uh, more table, round table style. So we'll be able to have more intimate conversation. Um, so up next, I would like to introduce Dr. Joyce Hampton. Uh, Dr. Hampton is a Dean for Student Success and Strategic Initiatives as well as full professor of ESL. Dr. Hampton has provided collaborative leadership in many of the divisions as well as overseeing the Center for Student Success, which we've mentioned a couple times today a student-centered space located on the second floor of the Alumni Library in this building, with offices from both academic affairs and student affairs, including academic advising, career services, diversity and inclusion, student accommodations and support services, and tutoring services. Please welcome Dr. Hampton. So good afternoon. If Shirley, if your job was to do the home run, you hit it. That's great. We're going to keep this short, sweet, and moving. But first of all, I want to say thank you for being here. I am very proud that Elms College is leading this conversation. I am very proud that when we are hosting the second of an annual Black Issues Summit, that this is what is happening on the Elms campus and the broader community, and we are convening that because we believe this is so important. When we talk about black issues, they are not solely the issues of one particular person or one particular group. It is a society. It is our issue in terms of where we are and where we need to be moving forward. I think about the mission of the college, Sisters of St. Joseph, when we were founded, the charism of uniting neighbor with neighbor, neighbor with God without distinction, and that moves us forward in terms of the work that we have to do here. When I think about ELMS, excellence is one of our core values, but excellence is only excellent, truly excellent, if it is inclusive in nature. And as I listened today, I was so humbled, I, just to hear you know, all of the different perspectives, so interdisciplinary, people who have devoted their lives to moving these conversations forward, whether it's in their work day to day with individuals, you know, eighth through 12th grade girls, whether it's the work that they're doing in research with history, whether it's educating teachers so that others can see the possibility of themselves. I think about Rich, you know, Haynes and having Ziamara here today and saying, I saw myself in you, and I knew that I belonged in education, and I have my future here. These are powerful things, but I want to simply say, I hope that as we wrap up today from all of these great, you know, high point moments, that really the most important thing we can say is, so what's my role in all of this? How do I reflect on this? What do we do? And as we do that, we can do that individually, but we can also do that, I, surely I go back to what you said, in terms of systemically, what do we do together? Because it's not just one individual, it's not just one institution, it is together that we move forward. Um, so, if you're able to stay, I'll give the plug back that um, Elena said to continue that conversation. If you're not able to, please join with people. Please join with others to continue that conversation because that's what we need in order to move things forward. I want to move on and just do some very quick thank yous, but they are supremely important. And so first, I'd like to say again, thank you to our speakers. You have been phenomenal. <laughs> So Richard Haynes and sharing his beautiful artwork, his expertise, Dr. Jana Hill, who had to get back on the train because she has commitments in New Jersey tomorrow, um, Dr. Toussaint Lossier, and your sharing of the historical perspective and issues happening today. And I would also say, Shirley, in your work with women, school districts, communities, you model that. And so thank you again. I also want to say thank you to our student moderators. I'm going to call out your name, and I would ask you if you are here to stand to be recognized. Um, Usman Safir. <laughs> Marie Claire Charles. <laughs> Alyssa Mercava. <laughs> and Jason Hosey.
Thank you for your leadership in guiding and facilitating our conversations after each speaker. I also want to say a huge thank you to our Black Issues Summit Planning Committee and continuing the work that was initiated last year. Appreciate the heroic effort you've made in taking something that was phenomenal and just elevating it. And now it is part of the ALMS culture in terms of what we must be doing from year to year. I want to say, first of all, Again, stand as I, I call your name, Ziamar De Labato, our Associate Director of Admissions. I think you're in the back there. <laughs> Dr. Damian Murray from History. <laughs> Scott Hartblay, Professor of Social Work. <laughs> and again, Marie Claire Charles is a member of the Planning Committee. Please stand. <laughs> So she has been doubly busy. And then finally, I want to recognize somebody that um, I'm very privileged to work with, and that is Elena McCauley. She's our Director of Diversity and Inclusion. <laughs> and she's really the founder in terms of this particular gathering of important conversations. So thank you for the work you do day to day. And thank you for the work that you've done in leading this amazing committee to bring about this event. And I want to say thank you to President Dume. You started this conversation and framed it in such a way that at Elms, we are known in terms of what we want to be part of that discussion. And I appreciate that so much. So thank you. So again, I end with the final question, what will I do, what will you do with what I've heard today? I've learned so many things here today and I have a lot to unpack and figure out. Um, but if you're able to stay, we invite you to do that. Thank you very much.